Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rhonda Miller. I'm an attorney with Dunlab, Ludwig and Bennett, or Dunlab, Bennett and Ludwig, as the sign says. And we're going to be talking about um, taking advantage of the TCJA tax rules before they sunset. So before we can get into our subject matter, I need to read you some um, housekeeping rules of um, the CLE today. So welcome to my law, CLE, and the Federal Bar Association's estate planning taking advantage of TCJA tax rules before they sunset webcast. During today's presentation, you may access the course materials from the handout section located on the left-hand side of your screen. When the class has concluded, a link to the evaluation form will be displayed on your screen. After you fill out the evaluation form and submit it, you will receive a confirmation page. Yes. Once you receive the confirmation page, a credit form will be emailed to you within three to four business days. Attendees seeking credit for this broadcast, please pay careful attention to the screen. A pop-up message containing a code will be displayed at various times during the presentation. You will need to submit the code each time it appears to qualify for CLE credit. Q&As. To ask questions via the web presentation, select the chat pod in the lower left corner of your screen. Then type and send your question that way. I have no idea what the Q&A meant, um, so I hope you do. But I'm happy to answer your questions if you have them. And I'd like to get started with our presentation. All right. So I'm going to skip over and about myself and really just start talking about the sub the substantive. Can't talk right now. The substantive um, portions of the outline. So we're going to start with the tax law changes that affected um, the applicable exclusion amount and then the GST exemption. Hopefully by now you have heard that each person's lifetime federal, um, lifetime gift and federal estate tax exemption has been raised to $11.18 million. Now that went up from what it was supposed to be this year had the tax law not gone into effect um, from 5.6 million, so it almost doubled. This exemption amount is going to increase um, each year for the next 10 years. It sunsets on December 31st of 2025. And each year, this exemption amount is going to go up um, and have a, a cost of living increase. So we should see this exemption amount go up slightly. I think we'll probably see it raised by $100,000-ish or so for the next 10 years. The estate tax exemption also increased to the exact same amount, the $11.81 million. The GST exemption also sunsets, meaning it goes away on December 31st, 2025. So I've put up a table because it's very interesting to see where the estate tax exemptions were. This very large, um, almost doubling of the estate tax exemption in this year. And then how in 2026 is going to grandfather back down around the um, $5.6 million range. And what I think it gives us is this amazing time to do planning with our clients that are lucky enough to have a very large estate or clients that really want to do some gifting and it's it's just a great opportunity to do planning. So the first thing that you really have to ask yourself and that people are worried about is the issue of clawback. And clawback is the idea is 
basically, if I take advantage of this $11.18 million exemption and I gift money out of my estate, but I don't die before um, the end of this period, so I don't, I don't die before December um, December um, December 2025, and I live beyond that, and the exemption falls back to the five point the five point six million dollar. Is that money going to be clawed back? Is that gift going to be clawed back into my estate? And that that is a reasonable question. And most people believe the answer to that question is no. It's not going to be clawed back. Um, I, I attended Heckerling. I've gone to the advanced state tax um, exemption. I've heard many lectures um, for from um, people that just feel that based on their reading of the code, the answer is no. But the fascinating thing about the reading of the code is it really doesn't say whether or not there's clawback. It's actually silent. Um, so it's an assumption based on the fact that it doesn't specifically say that there's going to be clawback. But the idea behind the drafting and how it was written is they expected Treasury would draft regulations to address the issue. So clawback is definitely not um, a done deal or a decided deal. It's actually something that when this law went into a place, they thought, okay, we're not really going to address it specifically. Um, we're going to allow Treasury to decide. Um, and as of the date of this presentation, Treasury has certainly not made a decision as to clawback. But most practitioners are proceeding with the idea that there will be no clawback, meaning that if you have a client and they have $11 million and they want to gift $5 million to their children right now, you can go ahead and you make that $5 million gift. And then that person dies in 2030, we're going to assume that that $5 million gift will not come back into their estate and they're safe to do so. And so that is um, what everybody believes that we can do. That is how everybody is proceeding and that is what people are doing. Um, Normally, if Treasury does a regulation and they make it retroactive, they do give you a chance to go back and fix whatever you've done, assuming something was such. Um, so I think that if they go against what everybody is thinking, they will go ahead and give us all a chance to go back and fix whatever planning we've done, making an assumption that there would be no clawback. Okay. So now I'd like to talk about the code Rule 199A. I think this is probably a very confusing portion of the code. This applies to businesses. Um, I'm finding when I'm speaking with my business owners that they do not know about this. They do not know about this deduction. They do not understand it. It's very clear to me um, this is the first year, of course, that it's going to apply. Um, that they're just operating, frankly, as if it doesn't exist. And it's really a shame because the qualified business income deduction is a really neat deduction. It actually allows a business owner um, to take a 20% deduction on qualified business income. So. This is after all of your expenses. So a business owner, let's say they're a lawyer, because many of you listening to this presentation are probably lawyers. And in this case, you have to be self-employed. So it may not apply to you, but you may know someone that it does apply to. Um, so if you're a lawyer, you have your own practice, and you you have you take all your normal expenses. So you deduct your bar dues, you deduct you know, all of your, your rent, you deduct your, if you have employees, your employee, or your employee expenses, and all of these expenses, and you're left with a profit. 
this 20% deduction is on that profit. So it's really a pretty great deduction. But there's a lot of permutations on who gets the deduction, what their income level has to be, um, what qualifies as income, um, and, and, and I think uh, a friend of mine said to me when they were trying just to read the section, they were into it for about 40 hours and they still didn't have a good grasp on it. Um, it's extremely difficult to understand, and I, I do believe that's why we have a lot of business owners that it applies to, and, and they just don't really, no one's really explained it to them, and, and it's very difficult. But we are going to try to get through, to it, through it today, and hopefully you'll walk away with some understanding of it. Okay, so first of all, the qualified business income deduction is potentially available to solo practitioners pass through entities. So that means if you are a single member LLC and you're a disregarded entity um, with the IRS, um, potentially um, C, um, S corporations and partnerships, as long as the partnerships is paying themselves a W-2 wage and they're not just doing distributions. So that's why we say potentially and we don't just assume everybody is going to get this deduction because they definitely have some rules as to, that have to be met in order to get a deduction. And there are some qualifications on service businesses. So there are limitations on service businesses and specified service businesses. So a service business is defined as any business where the individual's talent or skills attract customers to the business. When you think about that um, definition of a service business, it really can affect a lot of people, not just you know, lawyers, doctors, um, dentists, um, it can actually be a makeup artist. It can be someone, um, it could be someone that does hair, especially if they're so, so good at what they do that people go specifically to them because of their unique talent um, as opposed to the makeup person behind the counter at Nordstrom's. So different type of business. Um, So we also have a specified service business. So within the definition of service business, you have specified service business. And there are further regulations on specified service businesses. And the definition there are service businesses in the field of health, law, accounting, actuarial science, performing arts, consulting, athletics, financial services, brokerage services, or any trade or business where the principal assets of such trade or business is the reputation or skills of one or more employee. The definition does not include architects or engineers. It does affect, um, generally, most of the people that hear um, the presentation, which is um, unfortunate, so it definitely affects people in the field of law. Um, so then we have, what is your income? What is your qualified business income? And that, believe it or not, is not defined. And so you have to look at case law and you have to look at a lot of different cases and various cases and it comes down to um, I actually just put a summary on the slide rather than citing all the different cases um, that a business needs to have a profit motive and regular activity. And that means that business income from hobbies or intermittent business income, so if you have a business where you only do business in the summer or maybe you make jewelry and you only sell it when you go to 
you know, various fairs, maybe three times a year or so, that may not qualify under um, Rule 199A. Um, it's also possible for a person who only owns one rental property not to be eligible for this deduction. And it has to do with the definition of qualified business income and the idea that it has to be a regular activity. Okay, definition of wages. Um, most of us know what a W-2 wage W two is. Um, if you've ever gotten one, you you know what it is. Um, and then there's some additional things that can be um, included in your wages. So I'm not going to go through that. Qualified business income is your gain deduction or loss, and then you have the statute. But qualified business income, you actually have to deduct any capital gains from this amount of money. So if you have qualified business income and you also have capital gains in the same year, you have to subtract that from your qualified business income in order to have your end number. So now I want to review this table with you because I think it really summarizes, um, or at least I try to summarize, a lot of the rules that we're dealing with with Rule 199A. First of all, we have some personal income thresholds. So for specified service businesses, for non-specified service businesses, and then non-service business, and those are my three categories, and then I go through the personal income threshold. So for people who are married filing jointly, the personal income threshold is $315,000. For a single person, the personal income threshold is $157,500. So if that is your, the, the, if your w, W2 income is at that number or less than that number, then you're eligible to take the 20% deduction um, without limitation. And that's true for all three categories. For married filing jointly, if your income is between 315 hundred and three hundred and fifteen thousand and four hundred and fifteen thousand and then for single people if it's between a hundred and fifty seven five and two hundred and seven five for a specified service business we start getting a phase out deduction and so you have a limit based on your w-2 and then you have a limit um, the 20% deduction is, is start to be phased out so you don't get a full 20% deduction and, and they start phasing out the deduction. For non-service um, specified deductions, um, you're also limited to the phase out, but the, you, you have, um, you, you're also, they're also going to start phasing out the deduction but not quite to the same degree. Um, that they do for the specified service. And then for the um, non-service, again, you have a little bit of, they take a little bit away, but not, again, the service people are the ones that lose the, mo the specified service, lose the most of the deduction. Once you go over 415, married, filing jointly, and 2075, single, for a specified service business, there is no deduction. For a non-specified service business, they start doing the same type of limitation that they do for this service business where they're doing 50%, they do a 50% limitation um, of your deduction. And then um, for a non-service business, you're still eligible for the deduction, which is good, but again, they're doing um, a limitation. So 
what we're going to talk about as we get further in the outline are really um, techniques and things that people can do to keep their income down at the 315 level and then the 157.5 level because frankly the 20% deduction becomes very ineffective when you start the phase out rule. And um, it, it's better for you to, if you have your own business, it's much better for you to put in a profit sharing plan or a pension plan or something like that and reduce your taxable income than it is to, to get into the phase out range. I actually counseled one of my clients to get married this year. Um, um, I have a client, he said, well, I, I don't know if I'm going to get married this year or next year. And I said, get married this year because you're in the phase out range. And if you get married, you're, you'll get an extra, um, um, you, you can go up to 315 and her spouse to be doesn't have a lot of W2. And I said, it'll, it'll really help with this, um, the qualified income deduct this um, the QBI and she's like oh my gosh that's really great advice thank you and I'm like wow I'm responsible for a wedding this year because well, that's going to be a lot of work to get married in a couple months but they're going to do it anyway so getting married for tax purposes you know there's always a good reason to do something okay so now we're going to talk about how to implement more of this um, twenty per more of this um, QBI deduction. Okay, so the deduction cannot exceed the lesser of the combined QBI amount or 20% of the total, sorry, total taxable income minus capital gains. So I already mentioned the capital gains. So the combined QBI amount plus the deduction of each qualified trader business plus 20% of any um, REIT or dividend for personal tangible property deduction, but you have a rule that it cannot, it cannot exceed the lesser of 20% of the total taxable income um, minus capital gains. So let's look at this in a real life example. Jake is a married physician he has a combined QBI amount of $30,000, that's his deduction. His taxable income is $260,000. $260,000 times 20% is $52,000. So if we go back to the deduction on the prior page, the lesser of does not hurt him because $30,000 is less than $52,000 so he can take the deduction. Let's look at our next example. Another example. Rachel. Rachel is married and owns an insurance brokerage. Her combined QBI amount is $60,000, so that would be her deduction. However, due to a tax loss, her taxable income is only $220,000. $220,000 times 20% is $44,000. So then when you do the lesser of deduction, it doesn't pass. So $60,000 is greater than 44. I feel like we're back to second grade math here, maybe first grade math. Um, it's lesser. So then her deduction would actually be limited to the $44,000, not 60. See, so th th these are not um, difficult again. So I'm going to mention the capital gains again. The 20% deduction cannot exceed 20% of the next, the net personal taxable income minus capital gains. This applies to all taxpayer regardless of industry. So what we're saying is it applies to people that are in specified service, you know, service industries and non-service industries. So we're going to look at another example. Okay. Jenny is a married orthopedist. Her QBI deduction is $40,000. Her taxable income 
is $320,000. Now note, Jenny's income is over the 315. So Jenny would be um, in the phase out income, even though she's married and filing jointly, um, she would be over and start the phase out. Her husband has no taxable income. However, he has $20,000 in net capital gains. That would reduce their overall taxable income down to $300,000. So Jenny would then be able to take the $40,000. Um, 20% of 300000 is 80000 $40,000 is less than, I'm sorry, is 60000 $40,000 is less than 60000 The deduction stands. If you wonder where I get all these names from, and I don't use John Doe, Jane Doe, I use members of my family. So... I just find it boring to always use the dough people, so I just use members of my family. They think it's funny, um, so it's fine, with their permission. Okay, so now let's do one where the taxpayer is in the phase-out range. Okay, so in this case, we have a taxpayer in the phase-out range with a 20% QBI deduction, and it's limited by um, the W-2 limitation, which is the greater of. 50% of your allow allowable share of the qualified trade or business W-2 wage, or 25% of the W-2 wages with respect to the qualified trade or business, plus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis immediately after excuse me, acquisition of all qualified property. Here's our example. Joshua, who is single, owns 50% of a law firm that pays $200,000 in W-2 wages. His 20% his deduction is limited to one half times 50% of $200,000. His deduction is $50,000. What income is not eligible? Specified trade or business that's over 415. We've talked about this. All W 2 employee compensation, including S Corporation, shareholder W 2 um, Corporation. Partner guaranteed payment from partnership. So I mentioned distributions, capital gains, interest and dividends, retirement account withdrawals. Okay, now let's talk about how Rule 199A affects real property. So for clients that also own rental properties, um, Rule 199A applies here too. So once again, they can get an additional deduction. Um, this is, again, another calculation. And the calculation basically is, the limitation is the lesser of the calculation of 20% of QBI versus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis immediately after acquisition of all qualified property. The first thing that I need to mention is land is not included in this value. It's only the property. So it's considered tangible property subject to depreciation. Land is not included. Depreciation period is the later of regular depreciation period or 10 years. Triple net leases also not allowed to have um, a QBI deduction. A lot of people use triple net leases because they're an incredibly good lease. Um, but if you have one, you can't 
use this deduction. What is a triple net lease? It's when the tenant is responsible for paying the ongoing expenses of the property, including property tax insurance and maintenance. Okay, so now let's look at an example of um, the real property deduction. Ryan brought a commercial bought a commercial building with the siblings. The price of the building was $4.5 million. Remember, this is the price of the building. It excludes the land. The QBI on the building is half a million dollars. 20% of the QBI is $100,000. 2.5% of $4.5 million is $112,500. The results of the, uh, are a deduction of $100,000 as the taxpayer gets the lesser of the two calculation. Since Ryan bought this deduction, bought this building with his siblings, um, the deduction would be divided amongst the number of owners. Okay, let's talk about some other changes in the tax law. Um, so. The trust tax rate changed um, 0 to $255 is 10%. Two I'm sorry, $2,550. $2,551 to $9,150, 24%. $9,051 to $12,500, 37%. Basically, hardly anyone sets up a trust with less than $12,500 in it. I don't think I've ever done it. I've been practicing for 20 years. Um, the good news is the trust tax rate went down because the highest tax rate went down. But taxes, trusts are still taxed at the highest tax rate. I think it's important when you draft trust that the drafter be aware that any retained income or retained capital gains in the trust can be subject to the 37% tax. So it's important that the drafter draft the trust in such a manner that that money is going to be paid out. Um, if the money is paid out to the beneficiaries, the money is taxable at the beneficiaries level as opposed to the tax the trust level, the idea is most beneficiaries' tax rate is lower than the trust tax rate. If the money goes towards paying for expenses and things that the beneficiaries need, then you know that would be taxed. It, it, it may not even necessarily be taxed because it would go towards expenses. So I think everyone needs to be mindful of how they're drafting trust and um, very careful um, what they're drafting because of how high the trust tax rates are. Okay, capital gains. Um, again, I'm just going to read the top one. It's the same. It did not change at all. 20%. Um, nothing has changed. There's been some murmurs that it might change. Um, I'm not sure that's really going to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to make a political comment, um, but we'll see. Um, the new tax law did not amend how AMT applies to trusts and estates. For all trusts and estates with income less than $24,000, there's no AMT. The phase out on the threshold for trusts and estates is still $82,050. Trust and estates still have the $10,000 limitation on salt. And if a trust and estate, if a trust holds a qualified, um, a qualified trader business, or frankly, it it holds a real estate, um, real property that qualifies, it can get the 20% QBI deduction. Um, I put in our personal tax table because that changed as well. I put in what it was in 2017, I put in what it is in 2018. I really do not want to take a lot of time to go over it. Uh, obviously, the highest tax rate has gone down 2%, or maybe a little more than 2%, 2.6%. Um, 
and the 35% tax rate has widened substantially. So a lot of people's taxes, um, they're, they're, at least their tax rate has gone down. Single taxpayer deduction has gone up from 6,500 to 12. Married has increased from 13,000 to 24. You get, now if you have kids, you can claim $2,000 on them instead of one. And if you have a dependent um, that's a non-child, you can claim $500 on them. The credit is not phased out until AGT exceeds $400,000 for married filing jointly and $200,000 for individuals. Itemized deductions. There were a lot of changes to itemized deductions. I think a lot of people realize that. The, probably the one that got a lot of press is the SALT deduction being limited to $10,000 and the mortgage deduction being limited to interest paid only on $750,000 of debt. So people that have these enormous mortgages are just not going to be able to write off. Home equity debt is is no longer a write-off until after January 1st, 2026. Medical expenses are still deductible to the extent they exceed 7.5% of applicable AGI threshold. This applies to both regular taxpayers and taxpayers subject to AMT purposes in 2017 and 18. Okay, so deductions for um, professional fees, investment expenses, unreimbursed business expenses, they have gone away. I, I actually think this is a very unfortunate change in our tax code. Many teachers spend a lot of money out of their own pocket um, on the classrooms. They can't deduct it any longer. Um, many professionals spend money um, out of their own pocket um, for things that they want to do that their employee, their employer is not going to cover, that's not deductible any longer. Um, it's probably my least favorite um, change that they made in the tax code um, because I think it's patently unfair um, to hardworking people that don't necessarily make a lot of money. Um, that is there is my personal peeve in this new change in the tax code. Um, Personal casualty loss is another really large change. So here, and this, this is um, a true story, my neighbor had um, their house burglarized and had a significant amount of jewelry taken out of their house. Um, they know it was an inside job. The police realized that somebody knew it was in the house. Um, for whatever reason, they did not have insurance on the jewelry. Um, Maybe they didn't understand how homeowner's insurance works, but it wasn't insured. And they cannot take this as a deduction on their tax return because it is no longer um, deductible. So personal casualty loss due to theft cannot be deducted unless, actually personal casualty loss cannot be deducted period unless um, the president declares the area a natural disaster. So when we've had these hurricanes and they've hit, the president has declared the area as a natural disaster, all of those people are fine. But generally when it's just a single loss, you don't have that luxury of the president declaring your house a natural disaster, so you're not going to get that loss. Unless you're also subject to a natural disaster, and that would just be a lot of bad luck in one year. And in that case, if you got extra money from the loss that was covered, you could then deduct the other loss to the extent that you had an overflow of money. Um, cash to donations to charities increased to 60% of AGI from 50%, um, but you can't take a deduction for payments made in exchange for college athletic event seating. Again, these changes stay into effect till um, January 1, 2026, or you know, December 31st, 2025, whichever way you want to look at it. Changes to AMT. Um, so 
they increased the AMT exemption um, to $109,400 for married taxpayers and $70,300 for single taxpayers. AMT is phased out at $1 million for married taxpayers finally jointly and $500,000 for all other taxpayers, including trust. Um, this amount will be adjusted annually for inflation until December 31st. 2025. Kitty tax. So kitty tax is the idea that our children are taxed at a lower tax rate, which they are. And a lot of parents think, well, if I can just give some of my money where I'm being taxed at, you know, 37 percent to my child who really makes no money, then the tax rate is going to be much lower. And so a lot of parents and, and I go through this a lot in my own practice. They come in and they have this great idea and they're like, okay, I'm going to start this company and I'm going to funnel my money to my child who's nine years old. These are my favorite. And, 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 and you know, that way they're going to get taxed on the money. But the IRS has gotten smart. At, well, the IRS has gotten wise to this kind of um, things that parents try to do. And for a long time, we've had kitty tax. And so the idea behind it is if a child has money and gets money that they did not earn, then that money is going to be taxed at the parent's tax rate rather than the child's tax rate. So if your 16-year-old child is working at Panera, no big deal. That's money the child earns. But if your 16-year-old child suddenly reports that they made $125,000 on their income and doesn't have the W-2 to back it up, that child is going to be taxed at your tax rate because the IRS is going to assume that they earn the money from you. Um, if they have a job working at your law firm and they legitimately did the work and they showed up and they, you know, assisted you for a summer at your law firm again and they got paid and they paid all the taxes, not going to be a problem. But that's not usually what parents do. So, um, and under the new tax law, they actually made kitty tax more punitive. Um, so, other things that they've done is they've gotten rid of tax deductions for moving expenses, um, except for the armed forces. Um, it's not deductible until after January 1st, 2026. And then I think this got a lot of attention as well. Alimony payment is after the end of this year. So for any divorces that are finalized after December 31st, 2018, the payer of the alimony does not get a tax deduction. The receiver of the alimony does not have to pay income tax on the money received. And this change is permanent. From what I hear from my colleagues, there's a lot of divorces going on at this moment, trying to get finalized before the end of this year. Um, this is not a particularly popular um, change. Here's some good things that happened. 529 savings plan, you can use them to pay for primary and secondary school expenses. So if your child goes to private school, you can take money out of the 529 plan. Um, C corporations, C corporations got a significant tax break. Um, they now, instead of paying all their graduated rates, they pay a flat 21%. This is also permanent. And C corporations no longer pay AMT. Bonus depreciation. So for any qualified property put into service between September 28th, 2017 and December 31st, 2022, the first year bonus depreciation is now 100%. So I have a lot of clients right now that are buying some very large expensive pieces of property because you can deduct the entire piece of property um, on your taxes. After 2022, the depreciation is going to kind of really change. You can see it 80%, 60%, um, 40%, 20%, and 2026. So 
um, this isn't something that's going to change. Um, when I gave this before, I was really asked a question about the tax deductions for trusts. So people that administer trusts, and many people set up trusts for their families, and they want the trust to stay in place for forever, or you know, for the lifetime of a child, and for you know various reasons, people do th people do things, and you know. Definitely, the new tax code affects what's deductible for trust. Like, for example, trustee fees, which are usually 1% to 1.25% um, of the trust corpus. And sometimes trust, professional trustees will charge $12,000 just to start working on a trust. They are no longer deductible. Um, I've noted that none of the professional trustees have adjusted their fee schedule even though they're not deductible for the next um, 10 years. What is still deductible um, for a trust are attorney's fees, accounting fees, and these expenses. Um, again, Treasury is supposed to determine and, and clarify the deductibility of certain expenses. Um, this is a lot like we go back to my conversation about clawback. Certain itemized deductions, um, people feel that they're still there, they're still allowed. Um, Treasury is supposed to comment on it and clarify that. They have not done that yet. And then the other issue is, well, what happens when you have the year of distribution? So let's say... Um, I'm administering a trust, and the trust says that when the child turns 35, they get all the assets in the trust. Well, that's very simple. You know that year that, you know, the trust is going to, you know, it's going to, let's say it's next year. So in 2019, we're going to distribute the assets to the trust. The beneficiary cannot deduct attorney's fees, accounting fees, and so what I have suggested to attorneys that I've worked with is ha prepay those deductions the year before when they're deductible by the trust. Have the attorney um, take a retainer, have the CPA take a retainer, just pay, prepay as many deductible expenses that are deductible by the trust and not the beneficiary, so at least they still get to be deducted. So they're called bunching deductions, and you can go ahead and do that until we get a clarification um, from the IRS. In, in reading some of the clarification, um, they it seems like the IRS really seems to want to not only give the trust the deductibility, but they want to allow the beneficiary to have some of the deductibility. And it also seems like they're, um, they're I'm not sure what's going to happen with fiduciary expenses. Um, okay. So, I've also been asked to kind of talk about the future. Do I think this law is going to stay in place until, you know, December 31st, 2025? I don't know. Um, we just had the midterm election two days ago. We saw, you know, a change in the balance of power in the House. Um, I can't say what it, it means. I don't know. I, I am not a political commentator. I, I am really just an estate planning attorney that does, you know, high value estates. Um, from reading what everyone who is a political commentator said, um, they said the hot issue for this election was health care. So it certainly wasn't this tax law that, you know, had people voting. From what I read, if you read something different, don't write that in the comments. Um, it's definitely not part of my job. I think that the law will change when the balance of power changes. I don't know when the balance of power will change. Diane Feinstein has already said she'd like to take the estate tax and put it back at 3.5 million. 
when Hillary Clinton ran against Donald Trump, she said the same thing. She wanted to put a state tax back at 3.5 million. Um, very few people have a taxable estate and they collect very little money. Delaware just got rid of their state estate tax because they felt that having a state estate tax was actually deterring people from coming into their state and retiring there. And they were losing too many residents to Florida. Um, I don't think they factored in the weather at all. Um, however, I, you know, their factor was, okay, if we're charging people and we have a state tax and we have it set, maybe if we get rid of it, we'll have more people come and retire. So they got rid of it. Um, it really affects a de minimis amount of people, certainly at $5.6 million, and at $11.18 million affects even less people. If it goes back down to $3.5 million, it certainly puts a lot more people, um, you, you have more people that at least need some type of tax planning, so you at least use the husband and wife exemption, but still people aren't necessarily going to pay estate tax. Um, I think we have to wait and see. Uh, there was also some talk about potentially having another tax cut, um, making some rules that change retirement. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to get passed. Um, I think we're going to. I think we're in for an interesting two years. That that's that's my end of my commentary. Okay. So with this new tax law and with the 11.18 million dollars, what can you do? And what you really can do is generation skipping. And I think that's probably. Um, the most popular thing that I am doing at the moment. And the idea behind generation skipping is, so I, my parents, they have their estate. And then instead of leaving things to my brothers and I, they would skip us and leave everything to their 10 grandchildren. And if you do that, there is a tax for that and it's called generation skipping transfer tax. And like with the state tax, you have an exemption. You have an exemption amount at 11.18 million per person. Sometimes people want to set up a generation skipping trust while they're alive and they want to get some assets in there and get them to the grandchildren right away so the grandchildren can use them for college and buying a house and doing various things. And they really want to help their grandchildren have a good start in life. They don't necessarily want to give them their entire estate, but they want to give them some. So we set up GST um, trust. Often when we set up a GST trust, we don't have that trust terminate and go to any um, you know, we don't say, okay, when the grandchild is 35, they get all the money. We just have kind of keep it in trust for that child and then their child and their child. And it just goes on and on and on for generations to come. When money is in trust for grandchildren, for your children, and you set up these trusts, the money, as long as it stays in trust, is actually safe from creditors. Um... It's safe in the event that that grandchild gets a divorce. The divorcing spouse cannot make a claim for the money in the trust. So these are very popular instruments um, for grandparents. They really like this idea of giving money to their grandchildren, having this money be creditor protected, and then not having to worry about them making a bad choice in a marriage and then someone getting their hard-earned money. The one thing about the GST exemption, so that $11.18 million exemption, it is not transferable. So if on the death of the first to die, the person does not use their $11 million exemption, 
the surviving spouse can't save it and use it later and so have 22 million and change for when she dies to give to the grandchildren that trust has to be set up either before death or on the death of that person and use that GST exemption then so it's different rules with the state tax because the state tax exemption is transferable and we're going to talk about that um, so another name for um, a GST exemption a uh, trust where you set up GST exemption is a dynasty trust. Dynasty trust, the idea behind them is they're going to live forever. Um, they're just going to keep going and going and going and going. Um, when you write these, you really write them fairly general because while someone knows their children and their grandchildren, some people may even have great grandchildren, you don't necessarily know, you know, five generations from now what your family is going to be like, how big your family is going to be. Um, the trick when you're doing dynasty trust is you have to choose a jurisdiction that has the right perpetuities um, clause. So the rule of perpetuities, if we all think back to law school, because this was a question none of us liked, um, is the idea that the trust has to end. Um, they don't want it to go on forever and ever and ever. Mostly they were really worried about the passing of real property and that's, I believe I first learned about it in my properties class. But the idea behind the perpetuities is they didn't want property to be held within families forever and ever and ever and ever. So that's how the rule of perpetuities came about. And most of the United States uses the Uniform Power of Perpetuities Rule, which says a trust can last for 21 years after the last life in being or 90 years from the date of succession, of inception. And so what a lot of people do is they add the dependents of John F. Kennedy, Rockefeller, or Queen Victoria. Um, because they had a lot of descendants and their descendants are still around and they just have these really large families. I remember reading about Queen Victoria. I think she had like over nine children. She had a huge family. Um, and so that's why you name these people. And when you put these people in their trust, inevitably the first question or only question your client asks you is why are these people in my trust? So I usually preempt that question by saying this is why they're in there in a little write-up that I give my clients. Um, in Virginia, where I am located, the only thing that is applicable to the perpetuities clause is real property. I also practice in California and they use the 21 and 90 years, so they use it just right out of the box. However, um, Nevada changes that la the 90 years to 365 and so a lot of the states just have different rules. People want a dynasty trust and they don't want it to end, you have to move it to a jurisdiction where the perpetuities law is going to be favorable to that client. So I usually use Nevada, Delaware, um, Wyoming, North Dakota. There's a lot of good jurisdictions that you don't have to worry about the perpetuities law. You just have to make sure, I'm in a large firm, you have to make sure that you have someone in your firm that's licensed to practice there so you're not practicing law without a license. Okay. Um, I just want to point you to a resource. If you um, ever decide you want to do a dynasty trust, Steve Oshins has this really great one-page ranking um, of dynasty trusts. So it's in your materials. Hopefully you get a copy of this. Um, and it really shows you um, each state, why, what state is good and, and you know, what's not good about it. Okay, so the next type of trust that you can do under the new tax law are domestic asset protection trusts. So domestic asset protection trusts differ in that I mentioned with a GST trust, 
the grandchildren would get asset protection. But the person who sets up the trust, the grandparents, they are not necessarily getting asset protection for their assets. In a domestic asset protection trust, that is actually very different. In a domestic asset protection trust, the grantor, which is the person who sets up the trust, you can also call them a settlor or a trustor, the person who sets up the trust, they get asset protection for their own assets. So this is a self-settled, meaning it's my, I'm setting it up for myself, asset protection trust. So most of the time when you set up um, a DAP, you generally are setting them up to last forever. So like a dynasty trust, um, you're not just setting these up to last for 35 years. You're setting them up to go through the grantor's generation, their children, their grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in addition, you have to pick a jurisdiction that has a domestic asset protection trust um, law. So, you know, you can't just say, oh, yeah, you know, the client lives here in Florida, so I'm going to set the DAP up in Florida. While Florida has an amazing homestead rule and, you know, you can homestead your entire property, they do not have a domestic asset protection trust statute. Um, there are 17 states that have a domestic asset protection trust statute. Not all statutes are created equal. Um, so it's very important that you not only look at the jurisdiction, um, you need to know, you know, why you're doing the planning. You need to know what the primary goals are for your client. And you really need to choose the correct jurisdiction for your client. Um, Steve Oshins, we go back to him. He has a great one-page summary sheet of all the different jurisdictions and their pros and cons. And, you know, some, some of the jurisdictions who have asset protection um, trusts, I believe Hawaii is one of these places, only allows residents of Hawaii to do the trust in juris their jurisdiction. Virginia, of course, has a trust, um, an asset protection statute, but their statute says that the creditors of the person who sets up the trust can have, um, can actually have the asset. So I don't really know how much asset protection they actually offer. The majority of the decent jurisdictions um, basically have a two to four year statute of limitations. Um, and then after the statute of limitations um, pass, it really does offer creditor protection for the assets in the trust. You do not put all of your client's assets in this trust. The client has to have enough assets on the outside of the trust to be able to live off of those assets. You cannot put retirement assets in an asset protection trust. Um, the idea is if you have a client, single person, $20 million, uh, and maybe they're still working, maybe they have $5 million in retirement, they have their home, but $10 million is really out there, and it's after-tax money, I would take that $10 million and put it in the Asset Protection Trust to protect that from creditors and make sure it moves forward. And in, in this case, I would also take it out of their taxable estate. So it could grow tax-free um, for future generations. But um, there's a lot of art to doing asset protection planning. And I, I think the biggest issue with asset protection planning is people always call you after something happens. Um, I probably turn down more people than I do the work for um, because of this issue. So there is a Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act, and the issue is called fraudulent conveyance. And the rule is, is if you know of a lawsuit, you know the possibility of the lawsuit, there is um, 
a future idea of a lawsuit. There's any possible way your client is, is going to get sued. You cannot set up one of these trusts. You absolutely cannot. And not only is the client liable, but so is the lawyer. So it is incredibly important that you sit down with the client, you listen to the client, you ask a lot of questions of the client. People are usually fairly honest. They'll tell you, oh, I got into a car accident. And, and I'm going to get sued by that person. And the first thing I ask is, you know, I say, no, I'm not going to do an asset protection trust. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I can't. You just, you're not allowed to under those circumstances. I had people came, came in to see me. They were acting as their own um, general contractor. They didn't get insurance, and someone fell off their, the roof of their new house that they were building. Again, there's really not a lot you can do for people like that. And... You know, you just wait until the statute of limitation passes, and then if they still want to set up a trust, you're happy to help them. Usually in those circumstances, after they dodge the bullet, they don't want to set up the trust. They want to do it when they're not allowed to. And if you look, lawyers really have been prosecuted for helping people when they should not. And there's um, a pretty famous case in... Um, in Alaska where um, I believe he was a doctor set up an asset protection trust and he, he didn't have that much money to begin with and he put all of his money in the asset protection trust and then he just kept spending and spending and spending and spending and spending and, spending and was like whoo you know it was like a free pass to just run up all this credit card bill and run up all this debt and he thought yay you know I'm not gonna have to pay any of it back because all my assets are in this asset protection trust and shockingly the bankruptcy court pierced the asset protection trust and got the money and he said they you know they said look you know you did this on purpose you knew you didn't have the money to pay it you knew where all the money was locked up in the asset protection trust you know it was intentional and we're not gonna let you get out of paying you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt because you thought that you were protected with this asset protection trust. So I really think that as a practitioner, if you're going to do this type of planning, you have to be very careful of the clients that you take on. I have my clients and you're required to do an affidavit of solvency and this basically says that even if I set up this trust, I am solvent, I can pay my debt, I don't owe all this money, you know, this is how I plan on living and you really do get very um, personal and you ask a lot of personal questions of clients and you find out a lot about their finances and how they plan on paying things and I definitely do that because I feel that I'm liable if I make a bad decision. If I do the best that I can and I ask every question that I can and I collect all this information and somehow something goes wrong, then at least I can show I've done all my due diligence. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to be liable. So if you get a client and they pass the fraudulent conveyance issue, and, and I, I will say again, most of them don't. But once we get through all that and then they still want to set up a domestic asset protection trust, you choose your jurisdiction. Um, Nevada has the shortest statute of limitations. It's two years. Almost all of the other states have four. Um, probably my favorite jurisdiction, I use Nevada, and I, I love, love Wyoming um, as a jurisdiction. So, you know, I, I kind of listen to my client, I listen to what their greatest concerns are, and I choose between um, Wyoming and I choose between Nevada. I usually do not use Delaware, even though it's a really great jurisdiction, because it's too close. And even though the rules of the jurisdiction say in order to sue, you have to go to Delaware, I don't really think it's that difficult to do living in Virginia, and if my client is a Virginia resident, how hard is that to just go to Delaware? It's not very far away.
So you have to take that into consideration as well. You know, what are the rules of the jurisdiction? What are the, you know, what, how are they offering the asset protection? And what does someone have to do in order to sue the trust or sue the LLC? So once you decide what jurisdiction, you have to make sure if the client doesn't live in that state, normally they don't, you have to give them enough jurisdictional ties to that state for the trust to make sense. So the first thing you have to do is hire a professional trustee. Um, since I do a lot of these um, and I belong to an organization, I get some very decent rates with various professional trustees in certain jurisdictions. Other jurisdictions, um, it can be very high. So one of the clients of our firm is actually working, um, did it with a different law firm, and they're paying $20,000 a year to the professional trustee. And the professional trustee is not doing anything. They are not investing the money in the trust. They are not the distribution trustee. They are merely acting as a professional trustee. I think that is an amazing amount of money to pay a professional trustee to do nothing. Um, but that is what they are willing to pay this professional trustee. Most relationships that I have, the professional trustee is earning usually $1,200, $1,500 to $1,800 a year. Again, they don't do anything except be the professional trustee, and it's a role that they want to do. And that's all they're willing to do is really be the professional trustee, but someone else has to be in charge of investing the money and doing all of the other things for that trust. In addition, you need to set up an LLC in that same jurisdiction. So if you choose Wyoming, for example, and you get a Wyoming professional trustee, you then need to set up one, at least one, Wyoming LLC. So you have, um, you're getting more jurisdictional hooks. Then I like to open a bank account in Wyoming and put some money in there that, that goes with the Wyoming LLC. Um, and I like to do it with a smaller bank. I mean, it's not enough to do it with Bank of America in one of their branches. You really want to do it with a small bank in Wyoming that doesn't have branches all over um, the country. Sometimes the trust company, um, if they're small enough, will um, meet that requirement. When you're setting up um, the LLC, I will tell you in all of the good jurisdictions, we are dealing with a charging order only LLC. And what that means is if somebody sues the LLC and that's where you're going to park their assets. So I talked about the person with $10 million and they have $10 million in after-tax money. You take the after-tax money and you put it into this LLC. If somehow they were to not, they would sue the, they would sue the Domestic Asset Protection Trust and the LLC, the only thing they're really going to get in return if they sue an LLC in a charging order only jurisdiction is a lien. And that means if the person takes money out of the LLC for something other than taxes, then that lien holder would get paid. If they do not take money out of the LLC, then they don't get any money. Domestic Asset Protection Trust can be a, um, it, it can be what we call an IGIT, which is an intentionally defective grantor retained interest trust. That's a mouthful. So that means that. Um, we can, we can actually tax it at the level of the person that sets it up. So if you're not using it for tax purposes, you can do it like that. Or you can do a non-grantor trust. Um, so that means it's going to be taxed at the trust level. Most people that have $20 million are being taxed at a high tax rate. So you really need to determine why you're setting it up to begin with. But remember, you have to make sure you have enough jurisdictional ties. So you need the professional trustee, at least one LLC. Um, 
and you're looking at a charging order only jurisdiction. Okay. There's a private letter ruling um, that basically supports the idea of money assets being put into a DAP being a completed gift for estate tax purposes. Um, so I think that's important. The next one we're going to go into is a slat. Spousal Lifetime Access Trust. I don't make up any of these names. I, I think they're kind of hilarious that we just get these crazy names in estate planning, but I think probably all areas of law we have crazy names. So a sp spousal lifetime access trust is really the purpose of a spousal lifetime access trust is definitely tax planning. And it's the idea is to remove assets outside of the taxable estate of a couple. You cannot do this for single people. They have to be married. You can actually have one for the wife and one for the husband. But the idea is um, the husband is going to take or the wife is going to take some assets and they are going to gift it to the wife and then the children, the grandchildren, etc., etc. And it's going to go outside of the taxable estate. And again, we are going to look at many of the same jurisdictions that we looked at for domestic asset protection trusts, because even though asset protection is not our main concern here, it is a byproduct of setting up the slat, and you are getting asset protection for the spouse and for the assets in this in this trust. Again, you are going to use a professional trustee. You are going to use an LLC, and when you are either selling these assets to the slat or you are gifting the assets to the slat, you are going to get a discount. So using this for high net worth individuals, the idea is if we sell them and we use a promissory note, depending on how we, you know, we're going to use um, discounts for when we set up the LLC, you're going to use a 1%, 99% um, structure of ownership inside the LLC in order to get a valuation discount and we're going to do a discount for lack of marketability and lack of control. And that way if we are going to put the assets in there you're going to be able to take two 35 percent discounts on the amount of the assets. If I took ten thousand dollars and I put it into um, a slat, I would not use one LLC to do that. I would probably break it into three because I would get better discounts and I would I would be able to um, you know you you don't want the client to use all of their um, all of their eleven point one eight million dollars on just setting up the slat. And so the idea is you want to use as much discounting as possible. Also, if that's a joint asset, you can split the asset in two, five million per um, spouse, and then set reciprocal slats up. And um, meaning that each each spouse has a slat, it benefits the other party. Sometimes when you do these, um, it really might be one spouse's asset, and they are very concerned about doing this in the event of divorce, so you can write some um, provisions in this document that says in the event of divorce, you're no longer a beneficiary and the beneficiary passes to the child. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, just some changes that some states are exploring um, to allow people to preserve their SALT deduction. So it did not go on California's ballot. I will say that. This was not on their ballot, and I did look. Um, and now they have a new governor, so I'm not sure if this is going to make it on their ballot. Um, but 
California has filed legislation to allow residents to make voluntary contributions to the new California Excellent Fund in lieu of paying taxes. By doing this, they're still able to claim the full amount of the soft credit because the extra amount, the extra amount of the deduction would then be considered a charitable contribution um, to this California Excellent Fund and not capped. But um, I did check what made it onto their ballot. Um, I looked at, at everything that was on and this was not on there. And um, I don't know what the new governor is going to do. It should be interesting. Um, another thing that you can do is bunch deductions. So, you know, in order to take the medical deduction, it has to be 7.5% of AGI. And maybe you're someone that has a lot of medical deductions, but you never quite get there. Um, it's possible to prepay some in one year or delay paying some to another year so you can make it um, in one tax year. Um, I know that um, many of my business owners in December um, will prepay some of their, their expenses in order to take advantage of this. And again, um, it's just a way to make your deductions work for you and try to take advantage, you know, if your AGI is high. Other things that we can do is obviously we can still deduct charitable donations. But your charitable donation has to exceed um, the if you're married, $24,000 that you're automatically getting in your um, deduction. And for single people, I think it's 12000 So, you know, if you make your normal charitable deduction and it's, you know, three four $4,000 and it doesn't exceed already what you have as your main deduction, it's not going to help you. Um, if if you want to make a large charitable donation, you can set up a donor, donor advised fund. Um, plenty of places will do these for you. Usually they want you to do a minimum um, deduction, a minimum donation, usually around $50,000. Or some families um, set up charitable foundations. This is usually privately held foundations by the family. They can control where their charitable dollars go. And um, they are fairly heavily regulated by the IRS. So, um, um, but they really work for families that are charitably minded, um, that want to continue to do the charitable activity year after year after year. And, um, it's another possibility. For people who are retired and they're taking out the required minimum distribution of their IRA, you can actually, and, and these are people who have to take the required minimum distribution out of their IRA, so they're 70 and a half. If you are doing that, you can actually make a charitable deduction out of your RMD, required minimum distribution. Um, and if you do that out of your RMD, you will not pay income tax on the money. So there's um, a little tax t tip that you can give some of your retired clients. Um, and that's a nice little benefit for them. But you actually have to be 70 and a half in order to do it. Even though people sometimes take money out of their IRA in their 60s or their 401k in their 60s, they cannot do it. So I talked earlier about what do we do if we want to take that 199A deduction and we're going into the phase out. Um, you can reduce your taxable income using tax-free bonds. You can buy life insurance, so you know, prepay a whole life policy, um, buy an annuity, 
could do a real estate investment, an oil and gas investment, and charitable gifts. You can increase contributions to retirement plans. Set up a retirement plan if you don't have one in your business. Set up a pension plan um, with a retirement plan. You can do profit sharing contributions. You can also remove your building. So a lot of clients, I don't know why they do this, but they, their building and their company are all held in one asset. Take the building out of the company. If it's an S corporation, that's problematic because that's a taxable event. If it's an LLC and it's not taxed as an S, S corporation, it's not really as much of a problem. Um, remove the non-service part of your building uh, um, business from an, um, an entity. I, I do estate planning. I, um, a lot of estate planners, as a service to their clients, will store their clients' original documents. I don't know why they do that. Um, I, 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 I think storing electronic versions is one thing, but original documents make me nervous because I always think, well, what happens if you die? How are you going to get them all back to them? But you know, that's why I've never done it, but I do know a lot of lawyers that do this. And so that is a non-service business. You're a lawyer, you are a specified service provider, and then you're storing people's documents. You can take that and make that a separate business. Um, then you would have um, hopefully less income overall in your business, and um, you could um, have a different QBI deduction. Okay. Then here are some other really new types of um, ideas on how to get some of these deductions back. Um, so Jonathan Blotmeyer, um, he is very famous in the world of estate planning. He's with Peak Trust Company. Um, his idea to come, away, come around the salt cap is to basically set up um, multiple LLC, mul LLCs and take property that you have, you know, highly, um, property with a high net worth and you put it in either different LLCs or you set up multiple shares in your LLCs. And you also have to put some securities in this LLC as well. And then he wants you to put it into four non-grantor Alaskan trusts. Um, and then in his opinion, each one of these trusts with the LLCs would be allowed to take one of the SALT deductions. And so you'd be able to deduct $40,000 for the property as opposed to one $10,000 deduction. Okay. Bob Keebler has another idea for SALT, and he wants you to use ink trust. So an ink trust is a popular means of moving your income and um, transfer tax planning, and you have to move it into a state that doesn't have state income tax and also offers asset protection. So your choices with these are Alaska, Florida, Nevada, South Dakota, Texas, Washington, and Wyoming. Those are the four states, those are the states with no income tax. And these states also do not impose fiduciary income tax um, on trust di di um, distribution. However, you have to be careful about the jurisdiction that you live in because there are some jurisdictions that say if you set up a trust in an jurisdiction, we're going to tax um, that trust regardless. And the states that do that are also listed. Connecticut, District of Columbia, Illinois, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Michigan, Minnesota, Nebraska, Ohio, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Utah, Virginia, um, Vermont, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. Therefore, the planning won't work in those states. Um, but he believes that by setting up an ink trust, you could get the deduction that you're looking for there as well. Steve Oshins, who I've mentioned multiple times, 
um, when I've told you to look at his pages for his comparison charts, and they really are pretty great. Um, he has a plan for specified service professionals because of their phase out. And so he said, for a physician who has earnings in his practice for 1.8 million in order to maximize the 199A tax deductions, he suggests that the doctor set up eight separate non-grantor trusts for his three children and five grandchildren. The client gifts the children and grandchildren 10% of the new business in the trust, and then the client must pay a reasonable salary, take a reasonable salary, which he says is 315, and then pay himself some of the distribution, which will not hurt the 199A deduction. After doing that, each trust should be left with $150,000 a year in a pass-through profit, and he would get a $30,000 um, QBI deduction. If he, if he um, doesn't do that, he's going to lose the QBI deduction. Honestly, I'm not sure doing all that planning and setting up eight separate non-grantor trusts is worth a $30,000 deduction for the next 10 years. Um, I do think that you have to take some of what people are saying to do with a little bit of a grain of salt. This, these laws are only going to stay in place for the next 10 years. Um, if for some reason, you know, this particular um, person wants to set this up anyway, great. To do it, to get $30,000 a year, I'm not really sure it's worth it because the planning alone is going to cost probably more than that. Um, now let's talk about some tax planning. <coughs> With the $11.18 million tax, the one thing that most practitioners should be doing if you are indeed an estate planner is you need to be going back into your trust that you drafted in the 2000s and you need to be fixing the tax planning. Um, you really shouldn't have a lot of trusts um, that have, that are setting up um, either a bypass trust, credit shelter trust, see what else they're called, family trust. So the idea is upon the death of the first to die, um, you are going to m maximize the first to die's estate tax exemption. Um, by doing that, you may be taking all of the first to die's assets and putting it in that in that trust because to maximize their estate tax exemption when the exemption is $11.18 million, if um, the assets that that person has, let's say they have $3 million in their share of the assets, that may all go in there because we're maximizing their estate tax exemption. We don't need to do that. So it's really important that we are revisiting older trusts and old planning. In 2001, that was perfect planning. 2002, perfect planning. Now, not good. Um, so we need to fix that. Fix this. Um, right now, I think the go-to planning is portability. Portability is the idea that when the first spouse to die dies, you file a 706 tax return and you preserve the estate tax exemption of the first person to die, whatever it is that you know that year. So if they die this year, you're preserving $11.18 million to add to your estate tax exemption when you die. That's a lot of money and very, very easy. Um, you have to be mindful about portability. If you have a client with a larger estate, um, and they're, they really are on the large side. Assets continue to grow in the surviving spouse's um, taxable estate. So, you know, in all reality, if I have clients, and let's say they're about $12 million, and we're not, we're factoring out this 10-year period, um, 
you have to be kind of careful and you have to think if we're really close to that exemption and let's say they're right at like just under 10 or they're just at that what are the chances of them going over the estate tax exemption when the second person dies especially if the second person is very young and they have a lot of assets and they're not consuming their assets sometimes there's huge pensions coming into um, these estates and you really have to look at that um, if you set up with portability you have no asset protection for the assets going in the surviving spouse's trust and when you have a state with a state estate tax not every state offers portability some do and some don't you have to be very mindful um, of whether or not they can elect a state portability for a state tax exemption if you want to have a good summary of all of this I would point you to our firms um, we have a really nice page on our national website um, that talks about a state tax and we have a summary of every state and their um, the, the tax and then the death tax and the inheritance tax and so it's just a good one-stop shop to take a look at everything so what are the older tax formulas I already mentioned you know setting up um, a credit shelter trust and a really popular formula with credit shelter crust are pecuniary formulas and pecuniary, pecuniary formulas normally say let's put it all in um, disclaimer planning um, you can include that along with portability if you have one that's kind of on the cusp and that's where the dis surviving spouse can just disclaim assets as needed uh, I think that's probably a good one to take along with portability right now okay Ms. Taka we've already talked a bit about basis and I talked about the idea of having um, when you're doing a planning that you want to make sure that you are able to get discounts and fractional discounts on basis um, I think the other important things to know about basis is if parents gift their children while they're alive the child inherits that basis so whatever they paid for and whatever gain is in that asset the child will have that asset and all the basis if a child or a grandchild inherits an asset at death there is currently a step up in basis meaning that all of the capital gains is erased and it's as if the decedent bought it on the date of death and so I think it's very important again when you're counseling people that you mention when you gift this is the consequences when you die and you someone gets it this is the consequences and people are aware of that okay one way to get a step up in basis um, for people while they're alive because I think basis planning is really the new thing to do is to set up a parent or a parent law trust so you send the assets up a generation I would take all the assets that I'm concerned about maybe I have stock that has heavily appreciated or I have real estate that's heavily appreciated and I would gift it to my parents these have to be parents that don't have any other assets upon their death the idea is they gift it back to you now you cannot force your parents to gift it back to you they have to have a general power of appointment meaning they can actually do whatever they want with these assets if they feel like well you're too rich and your brother Jimmy doesn't have anything he, he, he lives you know hand to mouth every month I'm gonna give him some of your money they can do that that is the danger of this type of planning but if you actually get the money back from your parents you get these assets back from your parents you will get it at a stepped up stepped up basis and it's a very effective tool um, we talked about the discount valuations before 
um, lack of control and lack of marketability. They're very, um, they're widely used. You can also um, set up family limited liability companies and family limited partnerships to get discount valuations. The important thing, these companies must have a legitimate business purpose. They are frequently attacked by the IRS. These companies go down in flames when, you know, mom is 93 years old, all of a sudden the kids set up this family limited liability company. They use it, you know, for the house. It's worth $6 million. And mom is still living in the house in the day they die. And there's no reason to have this house in this family limited liability company except for tax reasons. The IRS does not look at tax planning as a legitimate business purpose. So these then fail. If you took mom's house and turned it into a bed and breakfast, whether mom liked it or not, that would then have a legitimate business purpose. The planning would not fail. Joint ownership. It's my favorite thing. People don't want to do estate planning, so they put their kid's name on the deed. Again, they inherit mom or dad's basis, and then any creditor of a joint owner can go ahead and come after that asset. Most parents don't know that. I think it's important to explain it. Um, Paul Lee has a very interesting basis shifting um, plan where you have older partners with no with huge basis and younger partners and high basis and they form a new company and they both put their assets in there and then they shift the basis where the younger partners get the high basis and the older partners get the lower basis asset. So the final type of planning that we can do, um, again, it's a great time to set up CRTs. So again, we're talking about basis. How do you get rid of basis? CRTs can do this for you. So with a charitable remainder trust, you can take C Corp stock, you can take um, highly appreciated property and sell the asset in the CRT. I'm going to repeat, sell the asset in the CRT. I've had a lot of clients come to me after they sold the asset and want to set up the CRT and it's too late. So the idea is you set up the trust and then you sell the asset inside of the trust and they do not pay capital gains on the asset. Law is 10% of the fair market value of the asset has to go to the remainder beneficiary, which has to be a charitable beneficiary, has to be a charitable beneficiary under the code. So it's not going to be your Uncle Jim. Um, it is going to be a proper charitable beneficiary. But during the lifetime of the charitable remainder trust, you are either going to pay a, an annuity, which is um, a set amount, 6% annuitized interest for 20 years, can come out and it could be Uncle Jim could be a beneficiary and he could get that 6% of the of the of the corpus of the trust and the interest created by the trust or you could set up a charitable uni trust and there's various types of these and I put them in the outline as well and again it can pay out a percentage and as long as that beneficiary the charitable beneficiary gets 10% um, these trusts work out incredibly well. Um, I am not a person that favors an annuity trust because I feel that to lock yourself into an annuity, it's very difficult. Um, but if you set that up, I think the most important thing that you need to do is to make sure that the trust can terminate early in the event that you start getting into dangerous ground and they're just, we're um, starting to get close to that 10%. Um, there was a time where, when our, you know, I, re I think you remember back in um, the mid 2000s when our real estate was crazy and these trusts were being set up um, to deal with um, all the capital gains. So, you know, a lot of companies were really over-promising the amount people were going to get for these. And then, of course, not only did our, our we had the stock market crash and it didn't work out so well. 
Um, a uni trust, you can sort of deal with um, the fluctuation of the market, still get money out of it, but not worry about exhausting what's inside of the trust. And so I've also listed all of the types of uni trust. Um, my favorite is the net income charitable remainder uni trust with makeup provisions because you can get an amount out of the trust. If the trust doesn't make enough, you don't take it out. And then in a year when it makes it, you can have a makeup provision where you can get that amount out of the trust. So that is usually the one that I set up the most because I feel that it gives people the greatest amount of flexibility. CRTs can benefit a group of people, specified people, um, there's various rules. And the final way that you can deal with basis um, is qualified small business stock trust. So this is um, a pretty interesting thing. It's not a really well-known thing. Um, this is only for C-Corps. Um, it's ideal for someone that's going to sell their C-Corp or someone's going to go through an IPO. And the idea is you have to have owned, owned your stock for at least five years. Um, to put the glasses on because I can't read all of your thing. Um, it has to be a domestic C-Corp. There is an aggregate rule about the the size of the C-Corp, so it cannot exceed $50 million um, the aggregate gross assets of the corporation. So obviously Wells Fargo and huge corporations cannot take advantage of it. It's, it's really for what they consider a smaller business. Um, and you need to be um, a stockholder that has the, the stock at the beginning basis. So someone that has it at relatively, you know, you, you got the stock for five cents, you got the stock for 10 cents. Um, and you can set up multiple trusts. So if you have 5,000 shares, 15,000 shares, you can actually use this. And I've set one up for the husband, one up for the wife, three up for the children. We've done the gifting. Then we've gone through the IPO. Um, what this does is it exempts the first $10 million in capital gains for the stock. So the idea is each trust, you don't want to have more in that trust than what's going to be equated to $10 million. And that's why you may, you have to give some to different people so you can, um, you can keep it within the $10 million range. It works incredibly well. Um, I've set up a lot of these. And I've done them particularly before people go through IPOs. Um, it, so this is another incredible tool and it's an alternative to a CRT. So with a CRT you're really limited in only taking out the income. You have to give away the principal. Also C-Corp stock can go in there as well. With this one you can do whatever you want with the $10 million. So you can see it's, it's really a much better solution um, for clients. Unfortunately, it's not available for people that have S-Corps. Um, some of my partners um, look at this and um, if there's enough time, they, they um, convert the company to a C-Corp because this option is just such a pretty, such a great option. So I have one more exciting thing to read to you. Okay. My law CLE and the Federal Bar Association would like to thank you for your participation today in today's broadcast. As stated during the beginning of today's class, the link to the online evaluation form is now displayed on your screen. After you fill out the evaluation form and submit it, a credit form will be emailed to you within three to four business days. You may now disconnect. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the class.